Everyone has skeletons in their closets, especially major world powers. Here in the US, there's a fierce battle between those who want to address those skeletons, like America's legacy of slavery, white supremacy, its genocide of Native Americans, and those who want to keep them locked in the closet and move on. Britain is having a similar debate. 2020's mass protests for racial justice here in the US inspired a host of demonstrations around the world, including in the UK, which has its own dark history of slavery and racial discrimination, a history that's been largely buried. And just like in the US, statues of slaveholders were taken down. People got upset about that. Online, more than 268,000 people signed a petition condemning the school curriculum there for failing to teach students about Britain's role in colonization and the shame of trading in slaves. A parliamentary committee took up the petition last year. I suspect we feel more comfortable looking at discrimination perpetuated by Americans than we do taking a closer look at our own history. We cannot continue to whitewash the UK's past. We believe that teachers should be able to use their own knowledge and expertise to determine how they teach pupils and to make the choices about what they teach. As I say, the UK does have a tremendous um, history that we should be proud of, standing up for freedom and tolerance around the world, from Magna Carta to our ongoing commitment to individual rights, civil liberties and freedoms. In fact, for years now, everyone from academics to activists to lawmakers have demanded that the UK do a better job teaching the real legacy of its imperial and colonial history. Last fall, this reawakening to Britain's history of colonial injustices made its way to the Caribbean. Many Caribbean countries were once British colonies and are still today considered part of the Commonwealth, with Queen Elizabeth as their head of state. But that came to an end in Barbados back in November in a mostly symbolic move. They officially became a republic after four centuries of history with the British Empire. When Prince William and Kate took a royal tour of Belize, Jamaica and the Bahamas in March, in part to celebrate the Queen's Platinum Jubilee, they were met with anti-colonial protests and demands for an apology and reparations for slavery. The wider British population doesn't really think the British Empire was all that bad, though. A 2019 YouGov poll found that just one in five Brits think countries were worse off after being colonised by Britain. As John Wilson, a history professor at King's College London, told The Guardian, the broader public debate about empire is extremely thin and gets used as a proxy for nationalism. Sound familiar? Well, a landmark new book aims to set the record straight on British history and to pull a lot of skeletons out of the closet. It's called Legacy of Violence, A History of the British Empire, and it's written by Pulitzer Prize-winning Harvard historian Caroline Elkins. Elkins, an American academic expert on the colonial era, uses newly unearthed records from 37 former British colonies. Here's how The Guardian described her book. In shocking, meticulous detail, Elkins reveals the barbarity of the British Empire and the hubris that fueled it. And Caroline Elkins joins me now. She's professor of history and African and African-American studies at Harvard. Thank you so much for coming on the show. What was the most shocking piece of research or part of history that you came across that people don't know or don't want to know? You know, I think it would be hard to point to one thing. It's the cumulative weight of the evidence, the degree to which violence is just the through line through the history of the British Empire. And I think insofar as if you were to really press me on, on, on the most shocking piece, it's the degree to which the British state was so complicit, not only in the crimes, but yeah. also in getting rid of the evidence. And why is it important? Let's just cut to the chase here, given the debates we're having in America, too. Why is it important, in your view, to know these kinds of stories, to know this history about some of the darker chapters of our past? Well, look, I, I think we're asking the question here in the United States. How did we arrive here today? How do we in the present understand the past and the ways it shapes the world in which we're living? And for us to just simply jettison out of hand debates over history as being purely academic or or the or or the sort of ramblings of woke faculty members this is real and live and affects the human experience today the roots of inequality the roots of racism the degrees to which countries which in theory were quote unquote civilized by the british the degrees to which these countries were born out of cauldrons of violence help us understand how the world is today how it is that lived experiences 20 years ago 50 years ago are affecting the ways in which nations the ways in which people are thinking about themselves their engagement with britain and also in britain itself how britain is is in the throes of what we call imperial history wars 
the degrees to which even even the monarchy, as they're about to celebrate the, the Platinum Jubilee, the degrees to which the monarchy is deeply imbricated into the ways in which the nation thinks of itself as being sort of an imperial exception. And Professor Elkins, this isn't your first time writing about British colonialism, I know. You made headlines more than a decade ago when you published a book on the brutal mm. British suppression of Kenyans. You revealed through documents how there was systemic torture and abuse for decades, and it led to a major high court case that resulted in reparations. How did your work on that book inspire this bigger piece? It was absolutely integral, right? And I sort of think back to that time in about 2005 when Imperial Reckoning came out, and I was just lambasted. This wasn't true. I was making it up. All the survivors from the detention camps that I had interviewed were, were lying. And of course, fast forward, this case that you just referred to was filed in 2009. And in the context of that, the British government discovered lots and lots of files that it had hidden away. And, and ultimately, the case is successful, and the British government pays out 20 million pounds in sterling and offers a, 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 an apology uh, for the torture that took place in, in Kenya. But you know, what I realized was I dropped into one moment in time. The way in which it was explained away when the settlement happened was Kenya was an exception. This didn't happen anywhere else. Yes. And so I spent yes. 15 years lining all this together to show, in fact, Kenya was not an exception. This was, in fact, endemic. No, well said there. Uh, do you think there's a growing awareness now around the legacy of the British Empire? You've got protests in the UK. We've seen what's going on in the Caribbean. Do you feel like the environment has changed since you wrote that last book? Yeah, unquestionably, right? Even the reception of this book. I mean, uh, the, the the fact that, as I mentioned before, these imperial history wars, this struggle on the one hand demands that road, roads must fall. And of course, remember, on the other hand, Boris Johnson's government hitching the wagon of Brexit to a kind of empire 2.0, that they're going to relive this, this, this moment of greatness, moving itself away from Europe and drawing upon these ties of a sort of imperial family, as they like to call it, to, in the former Commonwealth, in the Commonwealth and these former colonies. And so literally we're seeing these, these struggles over history um, playing out in the streets of Britain today, much like we see them happening in the United States. And I think that if we think we can keep a lid on this, um, you know, that's impossible. And the question now in my mind isn't whether or not empire was a good or bad thing, but how and why did we get here? The facts are what they are. It was an intensely violent experience for hundreds of years. So our question is to ask yeah. how and why did that happen? So one last question for you. I've got to ask about the Netflix series, The Crown. <laughs> Uh, which for many Americans is probably the primary source of information they have about the British monarchy and the British Empire. Um, do you think that's a show that whitewashes the British Empire and the British monarchy? It's a polarizing show. Do you think even, uh, you know, accidentally, unwittingly, there's a whitewashing of some of the stuff you write about? Oh, sure. I mean, you can consider legacy of violence sort of the, the anti-crown, if you will. And I, I, truth <laughs> be told, I watched it. I considered it research, right? And, and it's seductive. But, you know, there, there are kernels in that. And if you read my book and go back and watch it, for example, Louis Mountbatten, uh, who, is, who is intensely famous, the last viceroy, Prince Charles's, uh, yes. you know, sort of godfather, and he gets his legs blown up. He's killed by the IRA. And, of course, I was watching that that I remembered, gosh, I've got to—this is a bit of narrative detail to include. So empire touches the monarchy, and the monarchy very much wraps itself in empire. And it's time for us to disentangle that. So the, so the crown serves a yes. certain purpose, entertainment, but it, it's misleading. And I think we should always watch such things with, with great skepticism.